Phew. Great. Everybody, welcome to the live stream. So today, just the thumbnail and title suggests, we're going to take a look at uh, regulations, the good, the bad, and the downright shameful. So we'll do, we'll take a look first at a nice little bill here from uh, Texas Senator Ted Cruz. And uh, actually, it's looking pretty good. Also, we'll take a look at uh, Texas and uh, regulations as far as Bitcoin mining. Hint, they're going to be uh, cutting back and there's going to be more regulations put over there. And uh, also, we'll take a look at uh, the ugly and the downright shameful, which is the EU and crypto regulations as they start to impose their will. And lastly, just to get off the top of regulations, talk about some good news, big news, big names coming to play to earn gaming. And then at the very end, we'll do a little Q&A, five questions in five minutes. So we'll do all that. But first, let's take a look what's going on in the market. So if you're here for the live stream, welcome. If you're here to catch the uh, recording, just know there's going to be timestamps below. You can skip around to whatever you want to. And then uh, news takes about 10, 15 minutes, and then Q&A takes about five. So let's jump into it as soon as possible. So first of all, I want to say thanks to everybody who showed up last night to the PR meetup. This is going to be one of my last days here in Puerto Rico, going back to uh, Texas Saturday. And we'll be there for a couple of months, and we'll be back in Puerto Rico. But uh, thanks, everybody. I thought it was a good time. Got to meet some interesting people, and uh, we will do it again. So let's take a look at the actual market. So here's what we got. A little bit of red. And uh, not surprising, right? I think that, uh, I mean, I think we're all used to this. This isn't uh, the big deal. And then yesterday, I had said that uh, we were pretty much sideways and, you know, there wasn't really much going on. And of course, people correct me in the comments, which they are prone to do and told me all about uh, T-Fuel and Zillica and all those things. Hey, great. You know, if you're up on the market and there's uh, something in there that's uh, going up, that's fantastic. So, but I'm not going to uh, cover every single coin that's out there. If you are holding Zillica and T-Fuel, congratulations, or whatever else came up. Great. Just if we take a look at the top 20, I mean, one of the big winners today will be Solana, up 7.6, Avalanche at 8.5. And then anything else, eh, just kind of sideways, a little bit lower. And that's just how it is. So remember, if, uh, if you're here for Diamond Hands and the Hold Forever, there is an alternative. You can uh, take little profits along the way. Don't want that scary. And that's what's going on in the market. Let's take a look at the first story. And this was uh, regulations and talking about regulations and what's going on. And I need to clarify some things because yesterday we talked about some downright shameful regs that are coming out. And that's uh, state regulators cracking down on uh, Voyager, also cracking down also on uh, BlockFi. And of course, on Celsius, as uh, the cease and desist letters roll out, because they don't want us to have nice stuff. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. They're like, you know what? We don't like this, all these uh, yield and gaining all these things. We think that uh, we should slow down and we should stop that until we really get into it. And people were, on the, some people in the comments were understanding, but some people said, hey, Rob, isn't, what, isn't, what you, isn't this what you wanted? Didn't you want a bunch of regulations to come forth? And uh, so stop crying because this is what you asked for. Let's back up. So this was, I will link the video in the description. Uh, this was the thumbnail itself. And just to make things crystal clear, regulations and clarifications uh, is, is a wide spectrum. Okay, I think we can agree on that. So if, uh, if there's regulation, let's just take speed limits, for example, right? We know in a school zone, normally, we're not going to put a speed limit of 75 miles per hour as kids are driving all the way through. I think we can agree that's a, that's a pretty good uh, thing for the, for the city or the state to do, right? First, we have to decide, though, we have to clarify what is a school zone. That would be important, don't you think? And then uh, also, uh, there is one, say, one way to go. Well, regulations, as far as like speed limits go, 75 miles per hour in school zone is kind of ridiculous. But if we put the speed, zone, the speed limit to one mile per hour, that's just crazy. And that's the problem with regulations. First, you have to define, define and talk about what a clarification actually is. Let's take the example of crypto. Is this a security? Is this a commodity? Is this a currency? That's what I'm trying to get here, okay? Because if we can know these things, then we can work our way around it. So when I talk about regulations, I'm not talking about draconian measures where there is a uh, big brother swooping in and watching every single transaction. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about let's get a little clarification and let's move forward. Worked out okay for the internet when law 230 was passed in the 90s. So that's just what I have. Now let's take a look at some good stuff, right? So first of all, 
Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz, introduces a companion to uh, Emmerer's bill to exclude the CBDC coin. That's essentially what's going on here. So what do we have? This right here is all about this. Texas Senator Ted Cruz introduced campaign legislation into the U.S. Senate on Wednesday. That was yesterday. And uh, Minnesota Rep. Tom Emmer's bill wants to prohibit the Fed Reserve from issuing central bank digital currencies or CBDCs directly to individuals. Why is that? I'll give that in a second. Emmer introduced the House bill on January 18th. This was a while ago, January 18th. It is uh, March 31st. The wheels of justice do move slow, I guess, or the wheels of, uh, of Senate move slow. Cruz's legislation could potentially speed up the passage or rejection of the bill by allowing it to be considered in both chambers of Congress at the same time. Didn't know you could do that. Look at that. Emmer said in January, look, uh, requiring users to open up an account at the Fed, the Federal Reserve, to access a U.S. CBDC would put the Fed on an insidious path akin to China's digital authoritarianism. And this was actually a, a tweet that he sent out yesterday. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. The U.S. is not behind China on crypto. They're not. CBDCs are not crypto. So what he's saying is we're not behind. We're doing our due diligence. We're doing all the things. But CBDCs are, are, the, are the wrong thing. CBDCs are not crypto. Let me say that one more time because Tom is 100% correct. CBDCs are not crypto or in the vein of what we what we believe the best attributes of crypto to be. They're a government surveillance tool. Crypto creates freedom. It doesn't destroy it. And there was a comment here, and not this, not to single anybody out. Well, it's just a, it's a person, right? And he says, or he or she or they, I don't know. It says, uh, not much of a difference here. They are built on the same technology. True. And have ledgers, Tom. What is kept in a ledger? All the transactions. You can't be pro-crypto, anti-CBDC for that reason. So let me just break this down real quick. There's a huge difference between a CBDC and a cryptocurrency or digital asset. First of all, if the Fed Reserve is going to be issuing this, it's not really a crypto. It's not. I mean, it can be on a digital ledger, but that's a ledger of one that's in the Federal Reserve or maybe in the 12 different uh, different districts for the Federal Reserve banks, maybe. So if you have just 12 individuals and they all know each other and all can do those things, all those dollars that are actually put on that ledger, they can shut those down at any time. As my friend, uh, we'll call him Pete. Pete will say, yeah, well, if your social score sucks, we're going to take that away too. And don't even think about protesting against the government because we'll stop all the money flow. You know, if we can stop the money flow, what are you going to do? You're going to submit. So on this regard, you have to understand that if you just have a couple of different nodes, it's not a big thing and they can shut things down. However, now let's take Bitcoin. Let's fast forward and take a look at that. There are, I want to say over 10,000. Correct me in the comments. There's a lot of nodes that are all in the network that all have to verify the blockchain, that all have to approve or deny of this cryptocurrency. So if you have 10,000, as opposed to like 12 or just one, it's a lot harder to silence and to censor somebody. And that's the big difference between CBDCs, cryptocurrencies, and digital assets. I hope that makes sense. And uh, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. So let's, uh, let's finish up here with the article itself. So uh, Emmer also said that the Fed is not authorized to open up accounts for individuals because, I mean, if that's the case, what's the point of banks? Cruz's bill follows Monday's Democratic proposal in the House of Representatives to create an electronic version of the U.S. dollar, not based on blockchain tech issued by the Treasury Department instead of the Fed. This electronic currency would be device-based rather than account-based. So that is, uh, that is not positive, but I do like up here where Ted Cruz is like, you know what? We don't need these things. We need to get rid of them. CBDCs are bad. So when we talk about legislation and people who don't get it, I think Ted gets it. I get, I believe uh, Emmer gets it. So it's all about education. Hopefully we can move forward. So there is an example of some good regulation that I think we can all get behind. Let's take a look at something right in the middle and get down into it. So that would lead me to my next point, Texas and Bitcoin mining. So this was a an article just came out yesterday as well. Crypto miners in Texas need approval to energize a new grid hurdle. And when I read this, I'm like, this isn't good. But then when I did read it, I'm like, okay, this kind of does make sense. 
I'm going to ask for your input. So Texas, my great state, has started requiring new large-scale cryptocurrency miners to seek permission to connect to the state's power grid in anticipation of a flood of requests expected to drive up electricity demand. So first of all, if you're reading this, you're like, how dare they ask anybody anything? They should just be able to plug in and go. It's not so simple. Check this out. So the Electric Reliability Council of Texas is required requiring utilities to submit studies on the impact of miners and their large users tapping the grid before they can get approval to energize. ERCOT members voted Wednesday for, to form a task force to protect the grid from being overwhelmed. The move is a reaction to a surge in electricity demand expected from crypto miners this year and next. Texas regulators are grappling to understand how miners will tax a grid that has had its vulnerabilities exposed during a deadly winter storm last year. So that's just it. So if you're not if you forgot already, uh, there was a pretty big storm that came through Texas and it, and it uh, was a problem for the power grid to actually stay up, kind of like Puerto Rico's power grid, except they had the problem with hurricanes. Actually, they just have rolling blackouts. What are you going to do? So the problem was it was either bad infrastructure or just couldn't handle the demand. I keep getting conflicting reports. I hope that it's just a, a problem with the infrastructure and they can fix that and not an excess demand, which I think people were talking about. However, regardless, there is a point here. If you're going to have, there's a couple points actually. If, if you're going to have a ton of different miners come from China, Kazakhstan, they just got booted out of there and different parts of the world were like, you can't do this here. And then you have a bunch of them come to Texas. I'm happy with that. I'm good with that. But let's say you who are in Canada or in Mexico or in EU or in Australia, are you okay with having 80, 90% of the miners in America? Let me know in the comments. So there is uh, that issue apart. And then the next issue is if we have a ton of different miners coming in and it does put a stress on the grid, well, how's that going to work out for the different people in Texas? And we'll get to that in a second. Let's finish up the article. So uh, bah, bah, bah. crypto miners seek to add several gigawatts of demand this net this year and next, which poses a challenge for a grid operator that typically gets ahead up several years in advance from additional industries. And this is from uh, this quote is from Lee Bratcher, president of the Texas Blockchain Council. He says, we are entering into a dialogue with ERCOT now to ensure that this does not cause any delays for the Bitcoin miners. And here's the problem with setting up regulations now, again, 50-50 shot. Crypto firms are already being affected. Bitcoin miner Cormint received an ERCOT notice Tuesday that his project outside of Fort Stockton was throttled back to 25 megawatts. And uh, this was from the CEO, James uh, Mikovitty. Nailed it. He says, I hope we have enough time to get clarity so it doesn't derail the investment. If it takes three months, it will kill our project. And that's a problem for job growth and that's also a problem for the senators and representatives in that state because that's what they're trying to do. A miner with sev a servers on hand in an ideal location could be up and running within a couple of months, unlike the years it takes for a company to build a factory. And any project that will add 20 megawatts of demand on the size of a generator within the next two years will have to undergo this review process. Again, regulation. So here's the question. Is this regulation just? Or should they just allow anybody who wants to come in and then figure it out later? Will it be a big drain on the actual infrastructure or the power grid that is Texas? Something to ponder. Here's something to kind of help you, I guess, piece that out. So when they talk about ERCOT, ERCOT, let me go up here, is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And here's where we get all of our energy. This is their energy mix, 2020, if, you're if you worry about the ESG compliance and issues like that. 45% is natural gas, 20, almost 23% is wind, 18% is coal. And someone wrote into me and said, hey, Rob, it's not dirty coal like it used to be. There is a lot more standards in place, and we try to keep this, this dirty part to a bare minimum. Also, 11% is nuclear, 3% is other, and I'm sure there's a big uh, in influx of solar. So if we take a look at this, well, that's not too bad. Why don't we just increase a part of it? Before we get to that, let's take a look at the actual energy usage. So just so you know, the usage for Bitcoin, and this is from, this is not just from like some random, this is the University of Cambridge. They take a look at the electricity consumption index, just so you know. So it takes 22 
0.3 terawatts to power the Bitcoin blockchain. And this is the energy production, 0 0.3. So it goes from energy, whatever that is, to hydroelectric, to nuclear, to consuming an electric electricity to go this way. And then just so you know, terawatt hours per year, 137 is Bitcoin. Gold mining is 131. What do we get out of that? And I know people will say, but you know, your phones and your computers and it uses a little bit of gold. Is, is it that much? Is it? Can we find a replacement for that at some point? I don't, do I, I don't even wear, I don't know how many people wear gold watches. I just don't know. But uh, I don't think we need it that badly, but that's just me. Gold's got a place. I'm not hating on any gold bugs. I own gold, silver, Bitcoin. So sound off in the comment section, be a keyboard warrior. I could care less. I couldn't care less. So it, it, then as far as uh, the actual consumption, Bitcoin here is 138 terawatt hours. TVs in the US, 60. Paper and, man, paper and pulp is 586. Iron and steel, 1233. Chemicals, copper. Fridges, Jesus, fridges in the United States is 104. That's weird. All right. And then there's this one right here called loss and waste. And there's a reason why I told all this, all this to you. So there's this middle part right here, global gas flaring recovery potential. And what they're talking about here is if we used all the gas flaring, it could power the entire Bitcoin network five times over. Why is that important? It's important because of this reason. Because Exxon, this just came out on March 30th, is selling its gas leaks to Bitcoin miners as electricity. Here's the story quickly. ExxonMobil is running a pilot project where it sells industrial gas leaks as energy from Bitcoin farms, ordinarily gas leaks which occur when oil field drillers prick a natural gas reservoir or burned off as gas flares. Those are the curious jets of flames that illuminate the fields. Exxon, like many other oil producers, has pledged to eliminate routine gas flaring by 2030. And what's a great way to do that? Well, sell it off to the Bitcoin miners. And that is a way to do all these things. So if we take a look at this story, right now, I think it's a pretty good idea to get your ducks in a row and go, look, if you're going to do more than 20 terawatts or whatever the, the, the criteria was, you're going to have to go through an approval process as opposed to, this is the problem, as opposed to having all these miners come in, set up all the shop, and then they realize, oh, smokes, uh, we have just lost a huge amount of drain on the grid Where's this coming from? Oh, it's coming from this. And this, this is also Bitcoin miners. Well, shoot, maybe we should have set up a little bit of regulation first and go down this route. Again, this is one of those that are in the middle of the road. So the first one with Ted Cruz, totally agree. CBDCs, don't need them. The second one's in the middle of the road. Let me show you an example of ones that's kind of trash. And this will get into the downright shameful, to my last point, EU and crypto rate. So take a look at this one. EU lawmakers set to tighten up on crypto transfers. You're not going to like this. So the, the EU lawmakers were set on Thursday to back tougher safeguards for transfer of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Crypto exchange Coinbase has warned the rules would usher in a surveillance regime that stifles innovation, just like what with CBDCs. Under the proposal, crypto firms such as exchanges would have to obtain, hold, and submit information on those involved in all transfers. That would make it easy to identify and report suspicious transactions, freeze assets, discourage high-risk trans transactions, said Ev since Ernest Ertesun, Spanish Green Party law lawmaker. The commission had proposed applying the rule to transfers worth a thousand euros or more, so about a thousand bucks or more. But under the new agreement, this would mean all transfers would be in the scope. So every single transfer that is done gets reported to whatever governing body so they can probably approve or deny what it is. So I thought this was funny, this next part here, because those rules mean crypto firms must collect and share data on transactions. That's every single one, every single one. And the reason was an exemption for low value transfers is not appropriate as crypto users could dodge the rules by creating an almost unlimited number of transfers. That's why they scrapped the thousand dollars or more because they said, well, why don't just people just do $10 transfers or $10 transactions? Try doing that on Coinbase. <laughs> It'd be super expensive. Uh, Coinbase Chief Legal Officer Paul Grewal said in a blog on Monday that traditional cash, not crypto, was by far the most popular way to hide financial crime. So I hope that puts things in perspective as far as regulations go. There's good regulations, things that could actually clarify and go, you know what? This is an actual security. This is an actual currency. This is an actual commodity as opposed to just or getting rid of CBDCs as opposed to just saying, you know what, 
every transaction we need to scrutinize, we're going to approve or deny. We're going to so there is a spectrum as far as regulation goes. I think, and I still say this, I said this before, I'll say it again. I still think we need a little bit of regulation, a little bit of clarity to see exactly where we can possibly go. Because right now, if we had clarity, I guarantee Ripple wouldn't be where they're at right now. They would probably be at an all-time high. They would be basking in the sun. All those XRP holders would be pretty damn happy. Unfortunately, because there's no clarity and they brought them forth, now they got to deal with this nonsense. And I think unless we get, until we get clarity, we really can't move forward. That's just my two cents. Sound off in the comments section. Let's finish off with a really quick article, uh, Play to Earn Gaming, which I think is going to be pretty big. So I thought it was interesting because Play to Earn Gaming, it's, it's kind of controversial, especially with uh, traditional gamers. They just don't. They're, they're warming up to it. They still don't like it. So blockchain gaming firm across the ages gets 12 million. From who? Big names. So blockchain game developer across the ages said Monday it had scooped up $12 million in a seed funding round that includes some of the industry's heavy hitters. Across the ages, free to play and earn metaverse gaming platform. So funding from Ubisoft, 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 and Animoca Brands. So Ubisoft is uh, Fortnite. And uh, Animoca Brands is uh, Axie Infinity. So those are pretty big. Those are like traditional. Well, Ubi, uh, Fortnite is free to play. And they are one of the fastest. They were the fastest game to reach a billion dollars. I think it was in 2019. They were a free to play game. They made a billion dollars. How? Well, they squeeze their players. And they have them buy a bunch of stuff. And Animoca Brands, of course, everybody knows uh, Axie Infinity. Sebastian Borgut, co-founder and chief operating officer of Sandbox, as well as Polygon, all pitched in. The blockchain network that the game is based on also participated in the round. The game has garnished social following of almost half a million. The firm itself has a growing team of 140, 70 artists, and they've, they've pulled people from uh, titles like Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. Why is this important? It's just important to kind of see where things are going. Because I got to tell you, if you've got this much talent and you've got these big, huge brands behind it, they've probably done their due diligence and research and realize just how big it's going to be. If you want to follow them, I link this in the, in the description. Here's Cross the Ages. That's the game. It just was an interesting story. So that concludes everything for the news. It took about 20 minutes or so, not too bad. And uh, lastly, I will just say this. We are doing uh, the DCA show. Usually it's uh, me and Ben from Into the Cryptoverse and also James from Best Answers. Ben is traveling. I think he's going to go to the, he's traveling around. I think he went to Florida for the Bitcoin conference. Have fun. Uh, so we got uh, my man C.T. Larson in, in uh, as a guest, guest spot. So check that out. It's going to be like another hour and a half or so. And that is it for the news. If you got time, stick around. Let's do a little Q&A and uh, I'll answer all your burning questions. If not, thanks for stopping by. Thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't, but the thumbs down button's broke. And uh, leave a comment before you go. All right, let's take a look at what we got. Ah, thank you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Uh, 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 uh. Everybody loves CTO. <laughs> Chris Larson. <laughs> no, Chris Larson Verbal is not going to be there. CTO Larson. Aunt Lynn, thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the yard is looking good. Well, we're getting everything ready because, you know, we're taking off for a couple months. You know what that means? This house is getting rented on Airbnb because that's the whole thing. I don't understand. Like if you have an asset and it's not doing much for you, why don't you just rent it out? So I don't see why more people don't rent out there. Well, I guess I can see it. Some people don't like people to stay in their house. But for me, I'm like, well, we can make a lot of money. So let's do that. You James and you James and CTO should do a rap video. That'd be the lamest rap video of all time. Let's see. This is a good question. Do you think SLP part of Axie ecosystem will get caught up in the crossfires of the Ronan Bridge hack on Axie? That hack, it was all about bridges. It uh, makes you realize just how hackable things are because Wormhole was also a bridge, right? So first of all, I will say this: the team at Axie Infinity, uh, they have come out publicly and say, we're going to reimburse everybody that $600 million that was lost. We don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. So I think it's interesting to see how it goes. So the part of the ecosystem will get caught up probably because you have to understand 
Axie Infinity over the last year made $1.2 billion. That was the revenue. or that I think that's what they actually pulled in. And $600 million just got lost. So you just lost 50% of all your revenue. So part of that, part of those funds probably were supposed to go to uh, development, research, all those things. So if you're talking about ecosystems for growing, it's pretty tough when you just lost a ton of money. But uh, that's what I think about it. The big thing, though, is will it happen again? The answer is probably yes. All right. Yeah, Ubisoft makes Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed, was it? Uh, yeah. Obviously not a big gamer. Good question. Question number two. Does your dog travel back and forth with you? Both dogs travel both back and forth with us. Ah, damn it. Tyler said it. Fortnite is by Epic Games. Well, I was close. Ubisoft Assassin's Creed. Well, shoot. And what else? <laughs> Put about a dozen cameras. To, uh, cameras are going in right now, matter of fact. Right now. Hmm. Here's a great question. When do you think we should take some profits from Zillica? How much do you think it'll rally? Ugh. So I will just say a general blanket statement is uh, not investment advice, just investment opinion. But if I put in $1,000 into Zillica and it had grown to $2,000 worth in Zillica, I would probably take at least 1000 bucks out maybe 1100, maybe 1200 and just let the rest ride. Maybe it's, you know, takes off like crazy and go from there. that way. I don't have to worry when the next dip comes. Cause guess what? We know it's coming. So that would be the best uh, way to do it. Or just take a little, just peel a little bit off and just go from there. Again, everybody's goals are different. Some people, you know, if you're like in your twenties, uh, young kid and you're like, you know what? I can just let it ride for a while. Let it ride. We'll see how it goes. But it never, nobody ever went broke taking profits, but it does minimize your overall gains. That's the best I can say. <laughs> Lucas Bradley, I said Chainlink wouldn't be in top 10 in a year. I almost got murdered. There's, a, there's an inflation issue with Chainlink. That's the problem. Good to see you again, Lucas. I'll see you when I get back, man. Good times. Oh, yeah. So... Bullish on the news that Strike and Apple may have a deal, could bring in a ton of, could. I try to stay away from those, those stories because how many stories have we heard about Walmart and Litecoin, Amazon and AMP, Bitcoin and Walmart, Ethereum and Walmart. I mean, we just hear all these stories all the time and, and it's, it never, it, it doesn't materialize concrete wise. So I like to just kind of deal with what we know and um, I try not to speculate too much unless it's in investments. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, if it is true, that's great. I think it'll help out a lot. Um, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I know people are always, they're always telling me like how great it is that uh, this state or this city or this county is ex now accepting crypto to pay for taxes. And I'm like, who's, who's using their crypto for taxes? I mean, in all honesty, I can understand if you use payments for or use crypto for payments because maybe you're in a region that maybe got sanctioned or maybe your your currency, your fiat is uh, rapidly declining in value. So you have to use it. I get that. But if you're like in the U.S. and you're like, I can't wait to pay my, you know, my property taxes in Bitcoin. I don't know. So there's a good question. Still confident in keeping your cash in USDC on Voyager. So this would probably go back to the story that we had talked about yesterday, which looks like this. State regulars crack down on Voyager Digital's crypto interest offering. So here's the thing. I have no problem with, with Voyager. I do think they're going to work with the regulators like Steve had talked about. And, it'll be, and they'll, they'll come to some kind of conclusion or agreement, just like BlockFi. I don't think it's an issue where the state's going to come in and confiscate all the cryptocurrency. The worst that can happen, which would really suck, is if they come in and go and say, shut it all, shut all down any of this crypto interest. You're not going to do this until we figure this out. That would be the worst case scenario. Uh, they're not going to not allow me to take out my crypto, but I won't be able to gain that sweet 9% yield on USDC. 
because, you know, they want me to put in a crappy bank where I get 0.0125%. And that's it. Oh, and also, I know people in yesterday's comments were like, Rob's so naive. He doesn't realize that the states, <laughs> he doesn't realize that the states uh, work for the banks or the legislative body. Okay. So, God, I don't know how to even talk about it. I even shouldn't even brought it up. It's just, the thing is, is that it really just depends on on the prospect of what it brings to you, right? I can, I'm going to go back to Ted Cruz here, right? So some would, would might argue that Ted Cruz works because he's a senator, that he works for the banks. So if he works for the banks, why would he be going against a CBDC? Well, maybe it's not in his best interest to talk about CBDCs. Maybe there's another organization or group that maybe talked to him, or maybe he totally believes in it. I have no idea. So when you're going to make a blanket statement about like, oh, well, this, this state's legislative body must work for the banks because they're doing this way, or this person will do that, maybe, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter in the long run. The only thing that matters that really, really comes down to is where is the price going and what are you doing to get around it? Control the things that you can control and don't worry about the rest. That's what it comes down to. All right. Uh, <laughs> Voyager, I was Bane. Nah, I still like Voyager. I do. Now, a $30 price prediction wasn't so great. It went from 29 cents to seven bucks, and it went back down to two bucks, dollar fifty. Didn't work out. I also said Bitcoin's going to 150,000. Didn't work out either. So it went to 69,000. Ethereum, I thought it was going to 10,000. Went to like five. Nah, didn't hit those. So I don't do, if I do price predictions, it's a wide range. So like today, like I'll give you my price prediction for, for Bitcoin. This year, Bitcoin will be somewhere between $20,000 and $112,000. That's my 2022 Bitcoin price prediction. You're welcome. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's one. Sure. Okay, I did my job. No more questions. All right, so look, that's it for today. So I want to say thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It doesn't matter. Uh, the thumbs down thing is broke. Uh, but I'll see you later today. Uh, we'll be doing the, uh, again, the uh, Invest Answers, uh, CTO Larson and myself, DCA Show in about an hour. So we'll see you then. Anyhow, that's it for today. Thanks so much for being here and I'll see you on the next one. Adios.